Hello. My name is Oscar and today begins the beginning of a series of videos that will offer one of the most complete compilations of serial killers and psychopaths of all time. This project has been conceived with dedication and will be carried out over an extended period of time. Our goal is to provide content that is engaging and helps us better understand ourselves as a species. Through these stories, we will explore the darkest facets of the human condition and we hope that the result will be to everyone's liking. We start with John Bodkin Adams. Dr. Death. Classification, Serial Killer. Characteristics, Poisoner. Number of Victims, 163. Date of Crime, 1935 to 1956. Date of Arrest, October 1, 1956. Date of Birth, January 21, 1899. Victim Profile, Older Women, Patients. Crime Method, Poison. Place, Eastbourne, England, Great Britain. Status, he was acquitted on April 15, 1957. Died on July 4, 1983. Adams, widow killer or compassionate physician. In 1956 a portly Eastbourne doctor was arrested for poisoning wealthy old women and taking their money. The facts included the essential elements of a classic show trial, spiteful witnesses, dissenting experts, a surprising prosecution, and an astonishing defense. The doctor was deemed innocent, however many continue to believe that he was guilty of multiple murders. Suspicions, Juicy Profits Dr. Bodkin Adams's patients had a habit of dying under the influence of drugs, bequeathing him large sums. Was the kind doctor helping them on the journey to the other world? In 1956 the Eastbourne police began an investigation into his activities. On the evening of Sunday July 22, 1956, the Eastbourne coroner received a strange phone call from the town's most famous doctor, Dr. Bodkin Adams, requesting a favor, would you be willing to arrange a private autopsy for one of your patients? The judge politely refused to deviate from standard procedures. He then asked the doctor, when did the patient die? The patient is not dead yet, Adams replied. Hearing this answer, the judge was paralyzed. The next day the patient died. She was Gertrude Bobby Hullett, a bubbly 49-year-old great lady, recently widowed. She lived in the beautiful mansion on Hollywell Mount, which overlooked the English Channel. Likewise, she was a regular member of the meetings in which the actor Leslie Henson and his wife, the singers and Ziegler and Webster Booth, and the actress Marie Lore also participated. News leaked out that a younger colleague than Adams realized that the patient was going to die shortly and insisted that an autopsy be performed to verify Bodkin's diagnosis. The young doctor suspected that there was more to Mrs. Hullett's sudden death than his doctor had led him to believe. He assumed that she had passed away due to an overdose of medication. But Adams's colleague wasn't the only one who was suspicious. Also Leslie Henson, who practiced in Dublin, called the Eastbourne police chief to share his concern and later made an official statement at the police station. He was concerned about the way in which Dr. Adams had kept Mrs. Hullett sedated during the four months since her husband's death. My wife and I watched her become a drug addict, he would later say. We witnessed the disintegration of her mind. I'm sure the pills drove her to the brink of insanity, and that she died because of her. Some discreet inquiries were made and it was found that just before she fell into a coma Mrs. Hullett handed Dr. Adams a check for £1,000 and three days later left him her Rolls Royce as well. The Hollywell Mansion service confirmed that the lady herself had a drugged appearance. She, every morning she would stagger down the stairs, as if she were drunk. This is how one of her servants described it. Police Chief Richard Walker proudly guarded Eastbourne's reputation as a paradise retreat for the wealthy. To question Dr. Adams's reputation was almost unthinkable, since his patients included a number of eminent people. The doctor was rich, 
He didn't need another Rolls Royce, in fact, he already had one and other cars as well. But the chief of police had also not gone unnoticed by the persistent gossip circulating through the town, gossip linking the doctor's generous use of drugs to his enrichment through numerous legacies. It was said that he would call on him with a vial of morphine in one pocket and a blank bequest form in the other. Dr. Bodkin Adams was short but stout, standing six feet tall and weighing about 250 pounds. He was bald, with a plump pink face, small eyes behind Crippen-style glasses, and a disconcerting habit of frequently rolling them blank. But he was also a master of how to treat the sick, and he especially won over the elderly female patients. He tended to his medical needs, and beyond that he combed their hair, and on occasion even fondled their breasts. He also offered the spiritual rest that his faith generated, he always invoked the Almighty while he recognized the sick, and he knelt down to pray before entering the room where the patient was lying on the bed. The advanced age and relative lack of fame enjoyed by his alleged victims made it possible to keep gossip at bay. But Bobby Hullett was a different case. Now she was not a fragile and lonely 80-year-old old woman, but a middle-aged woman, with an intense social life and good friends in the world of theater and high society. Bobby's body underwent three autopsies, the last one by Professor Francis Camps, a famous home office pathologist specializing in murder cases. The world outside Eastbourne first learned of Dr. Adams on Friday, July 26, 1956. The newspaper headline read, Murderer of Wealthy Widows Investigated, and he managed to get a place on the front page, next to the news of the occupation of the Suez Canal by President Nasser and the sinking of the Andrea Doria ocean liner in the Atlantic. The story continued to swell until it became six mysteriously murdered women. The case became more important when Commissioner Herbert Hannum of Scotland Yard took charge of the investigation. The jury in the pre-inquest in the Hullet case returned a unanimous verdict, suicide by overdose of sleeping pills. The coroner's examining judge severely reprimanded Dr. Adams for revealing an extraordinarily high degree of negligence in treatment. But this action by justice went unnoticed. The newspapers published big sensational headlines and scandalous revelations. The Yard investigates a mass poisoning, 25 deaths in the Great Eastbourne Mystery, said one of the articles. And later, investigation of 400 wills, the victims are rich women. British readers were informed, Scotland Yard's investigative team was going back 20 years in Eastbourne's history looking for poisonings of wealthy women. Hundreds of possible cases were talked about and gruesome stories were published about soil samples being collected for analysis in cemeteries. It was suggested that the killer was a homicidal hypnotist who exerted a Rasputinesque control over his aged and feeble victims. The actual facts behind these sensational reports were these, Hannum and Commissioner Hewitt, together with another yard sergeant and an Eastbourne inspector, Pew, launched an investigation into Dr. Adams' professional life to check for any indications of fraud or murder. The reports were combed by an auxiliary team of detectives in their offices. Meanwhile, the trio of inspectors penetrated the private life that lurked behind the luxuriously curtained windows of dozens of houses. The occupants were questioned, but in many cases the relatives were either dead or too old to remember things clearly. Most of the bodies had been cremated, or degraded enough to be beyond the reach of forensic science. The image that resulted from Adams after the investigations was far from pleasant. He appeared as a greedy, greedy doctor, with dubious principles, an insatiable legacy hunter. The statements of lawyers and bank managers were unanimous in one thing, the insistence and pressure that the doctor exerted on his patients to modify their wills in his favor, going so far as to guide the dying hand of the testator himself. Evidence of forgery and extortion was also found, and descriptions of the doctor haphazardly searching an already abandoned house in search of what might still be found of value. A venerable old lady told the police how she had beaten him from her house with her gold-headed cane, 
when she caught him whispering in her dying husband's ear to leave the estate and house to her, and that he he would take care of his wife. Painstaking investigation brought to light 132 wills totaling £45,000 in bequests in his favor, a very respectable sum for the time. There were cases in which the doctor had omitted to declare that he was the beneficiary, with which the deceased was cremated without performing the autopsy, otherwise mandatory. Study of death certificates issued by the doctor also raised the question of his ability to make accurate or honest diagnoses, given that a much higher proportion of patients than usual suffered from cerebral hemorrhage or cerebral thrombosis. At least that was what was specified as the cause of death. Cases of a sudden worsening and, very soon after, the patient's death aroused particular interest. It was due to the fact that the death occurred almost immediately after the patient modified his will. Relatives of 82-year-old Julia Bradnam requested the yard's special attention. Mrs. Bradnam passed away unexpectedly, with lightning speed, in 1952, leaving Dr. Adams as sole executor of her new will. The police exhumed her body. Sometimes investigators came across really vivid testimony. In the case of Annabel Kilger, who died in 1950, a nurse testified that she was so shocked by the dose the doctor injected her with before she slipped into an irreversible coma that she commented, Doctor, do you realize that has he killed her? Scotland Yard also unearthed the bodies of Hilda and Clara Neil Miller, spinster sisters who died in 1953 and 1954. Hilda bequeathed most of her possessions to Clara, and Clara passed them on to her doctor. One of the people who was visiting a relative described the doctor's last consultation. She stayed with the patient for 45 minutes, afterwards I was intrigued when I didn't hear any noise coming from the room. I opened the door and what I saw horrified me. It was a very cold winter night, the sheets and blankets were on the floor and she had pulled the woman's nightgown up to her neck. All the windows in the room were wide open. This is how the doctor left her. At the end of October Hannon forwarded her report to Sir Theobald Matthew, the Attorney General. Its thickness was said to be 30 centimeters. Once, over a quiet beer one stormy night at the Beachy Head Hotel, Hannum confided to a reporter, I am convinced that Adams is a serial killer. He for sure he has killed 14 people. If we had dedicated ourselves to investigating even more distant dates, I think he would have been able to say that he killed even more people. Harassment of the Doctor Only two voices defended the doctor's cause during the months of the investigation. One was that of the editor of the Weekly Tribune, the radical politician Michael Foote. On August 22, 1956, Foote commented, The information offered by the press constitutes one of the most startling and shameful examples of tabloid journalism in the history of the British press. The other voice was that of the Daily Express, the only popular newspaper to side with the doctor. In part, he did so because his legal advisor, Peter, later Lord, Rawlinson, was a fierce critic of Commissioner Hannum. Rawlinson had been the defense attorney in the Topath case, him battling for two days on the witness stand with Hannum, because of the methods he used to obtain a confession. But abroad the doctor's cause appeared even darker. Before the trial, the American Weekly True Detective published a long and damning article about Britain's deadly Dr. Adams, and titled it, Better Kill Than Cure. Hannum of the Yard The police team investigating the Adams case was led by Detective Commissioner Herbert Wheeler Walter Hannum, for the Hannum of the Yard Press. He was also known under the nickname El Conde, because of his great elegance in clothing, his taste for expensive cigars, and his demeanor, he walked so straight that when he entered the courtroom he gave the impression of leaning. Backward Hannum joined the police during the Great Depression of the 1920s, when he was still just a teenage recruit. He was ambitious and cunning, he studied accounting laws and regulations in depth on his own, until he became an expert in money fraud. He then he was appointed liaison officer between Scotland Yard and the Bank of England. His fame came to him in 1953, 
the coronation year, when he managed to solve the Teddington Towpath murders of two young girls. When he took on the Eastbourne case, he was 48 years old. Hannam's closest team consisted of a Scotland Yard detective sergeant, Hewitt, and a local policeman, Inspector Pugh. Charlie Hewitt was a man from a police family, his was the fourth generation to be dedicated to the trade. He was an energetic, sharp and scrupulous person. Bryn Pugh worked with an added burden, Dr. Adams was his family's GP. Open debate, poison and get rich. Adams' alleged crimes were nothing new. As early as 1856 a Staffordshire doctor was found guilty of poisoning for money. Bodkin Adams was not the first doctor to be put on trial at the Old Bailey for killing his patients. Exactly 100 years earlier, the case of Dr. William Palmer of Rugeley, Staffordshire, set a chilling precedent. In 1856, as in 1956, the British public combined a morbid curiosity with a sense of dread when talking about a doctor spreading death among his patients. Dr. Palmer was so criticized in his time that Parliament passed the so-called Palmer Law. It allowed the defendant to choose to be tried in London when the circumstances suggested that it would not be possible to maintain the necessary impartiality in the competent judicial district. Billy Palmer had a reputation as a spendthrift, womanizer, and gambler. Like Adams, his past was a key factor, he had a domineering mother, and his appearance was plump, without being fat under an always red complexion. He was especially proud of his small, chubby hands, which he subjected to a permanent and careful manicure and always tried to protect them with soft leather gloves. Rumors about his person began very early. During his student days at Stafford Infirmary it was already said that Billy experimented with poisons, and that he put them in his classmates' drinks to make them drowsy or make them vomit. After a round of drinks with Billy, a shoemaker named Abley fell dead to the ground. But the autopsy revealed no traces of poison. Even so, that event was not forgotten. The young Dr. Palmer inherited the handsome sum of £7,000, rented a fine house for £25 a year, and married a pretty local lady, a very pious girl named Annie Brooks. Everything might have gone well if she hadn't been taken over by his obsession with horse racing. Not content with gambling, he decided to found his own stable and participate in the races. So he began to get seriously into debt. What followed was euphemistically called, an unfortunate series of deaths. The first to leave the world of the living was the doctor's mother-in-law, by a stroke, it was said, just two weeks after moving into the doctor's home. All her cats also died. At three months old, wealthy Uncle Joseph fell into a fatal dream after drinking cognac with his niece. Later it was the turn of a racing colleague, Leonard Bladen, he became suddenly and seriously ill in the company of Dr. Palmer, dying a few moments later. He had just won a large sum at the Chester races, when they found it, his purse contained only a few pounds and his betting book was missing. Cats and humans were not the only ones who suffered from Palmer's curse, he also touched purebreds. The doctor achieved one of his few racing successes by winning the Marquis of Anglesey trophy, following the sudden death of his favorite horse, by eating an arsenic-filled carrot, it is said. Dr. Palmer was beginning to earn a certain reputation, but he took care not to let this spoil his party, here comes the poisoner, he said of himself when entering a tavern. Or again, what, boy, which is your favorite poison, prussic acid or arsenic? This tagline was used when inviting someone to a drink. The Palmers had a son named William, then they lost a series of babies, dead in infancy. The owner of the house where they lived maintained that the doctor dipped his little finger in poison, then disguised it with honey, and immediately gave it to the little boy to suck on. The fact that his wife began to feel unwell is not something that can surprise us anymore, nor is it that he took the wise precaution of taking out life insurance on her. As it could not be less, Annie fell seriously ill and died. Her husband diagnosed cholera, seized the £13,000 insurance, paid the most pressing debts, 
and consoled himself for his terrible loss with Eliza, Annie's maid. Shortly afterwards he insured the life of his dipsomaniac brother Walter for £14,000 and furthered his addiction by granting him unlimited credit at the local liquor store. In order to restore his fortune, he tried to win a juicy prize in the races. She entered her mare, Nettle, in the 1855 Oaks, and backed her chances with such a good hand that she came out two to one favorite. Nettle was galloping second when she swerved sharply and knocked the jockey off her feet. Luckily, Walter Palmer had gin up to his ears and honored his logical destiny, he passed away. Since the insurer suspected something strange, she delayed the payment, which led the doctor, who had already spent the advance granted by the company, in a tight spot, to a curious attempt to make short money, for which he secured the life of one of the stable boys named Bate, waiting, naturally benefit from his early demise. But Bate was alarmed at the prospect, and meanwhile the insurance company found out that he was an unrepentant drinker. Palmer's creditors were beginning to tighten the screws when he ran into his friend John Parson Cook at the Shrewsbury races. He had just won a small fortune on his horse, Polestar, and during the victory celebration he began to feel bad and complain that the brandy tasted funny. Back in Rugeley, the doctor put Cook up in a hotel directly opposite his house and went to London to claim his friend's winnings as his own. At night, and after returning from London, he visited him. His condition was rapidly deteriorating, and Palmer then sought the opinion of a second doctor, Dr. William Jones, a close friend of the patient. John Parson Cook died the next day in the company of Dr. Jones. William Palmer contacted the undertaker and urged him to get that burial done quick. But Cook's stepfather was not convinced of the natural death of his stepson and requested an autopsy. The most obvious piece of evidence against Palmer was that on the day of Cook's death he had bought a large quantity of strychnine at a local pharmacy. But the post-mortem doctor at Guy's Hospital found no trace of the poison, concluding that he must have been given an amount so carefully calculated that he left no trace. The preview jury concluded that it was premeditated murder. The remains of the doctor's wife and her brother were exhumed. Two more murder verdicts were added to the existing one. Throughout the country Palmer was held responsible for murder, and popular legend came to attribute 14 more to him. The trial began at the Old Bailey on May 14, and kept the whole of Britain waiting for a record time, 12 days. The Crown's indictment against Palmer maintained that Palmer had weakened Cook with repeated doses of an emetic at Shrewsbury and Rugeley, and had finally dispatched him with strychnine. Seven medical authorities agreed that Cook had to have died of strychnine poisoning, eleven others said he had not, and eleven more did not judge. No one paid the slightest attention to the opinion of Dr. Jones, who insisted that the patient had died of natural causes. The jury took 77 minutes to deliver their guilty verdict. Dr. Palmer received the news of his death sentence with stoicism, commenting only, I am a murdered man. After the conviction, popular sentiment towards him changed and meetings were organized to protest the way in which the medical evidence was presented. The Home Secretary, Sir George Grey, has rejected calls to reopen the case. Palmer was hanged in Stafford on June 14, 1856. Revelers hoping to enjoy the spectacle filled the town's bars all night. By daybreak, more than 30,000 people had gathered on the 23 platforms and stands set up in front of the gallows covered in black cloth. A good view was worth a guinea. Just before 8 o'clock in the morning the prison bell began to ring, and the condemned man came on the scene. The prisoner climbed the steps of the scaffold with frank ease, adopting an almost jaunty air. The crowd began to scream, but then there was silence, waiting for the condemned man's last words. Palmer said nothing. All that received the mass of curious. It was an inattentive glance of the condemned, he immediately afterwards plunged into a brief prayer with the chaplain. He shook hands with the executioner, felt the rope around his neck, the trapdoor fell, and his body was left hanging lifeless. Trap. Timo, 
The crowd shouted when they saw that they would no longer attend a desperate and tragic struggle with death. He got off the body and went back to the prison. There an exact cast of the deceased's head was made. A century later, when the Adams Fuhrer was in its infancy, Palmer's wax statue was still decorating the Chamber of Horrors at Madame Tussauds in London. Lethal Tradition The first doctor convicted of poisoning to get rich was Dr. Edmi Castaing, from Paris. He ended up on the guillotine in 1823 for murdering the brothers Hippolyte and Auguste Ballet. As in the case of Dr. Adams, Casting administered an overdose of morphine to his patients. The cause, benefit from his legacy. Three years after Palmer's trial at the Old Bailey, a jury took no more than 40 minutes to convict another doctor who had committed bigamy, marrying a second woman and murdering her after her in order to inherit her money. Here too we find certain similarities. Dr. Thomas Smethurst was an unpopular character. People wanted to see him hanging from a rope, but the post-mortem examination was inconclusive. Ten medical witnesses claimed that the wife had been murdered, seven others opted for natural death. The judge decided on a compromise, Smethurst did not reach the scaffold, but ended up in prison. The Medical Times challenged the decision, is the prisoner guilty? We think so. Was he proven guilty? Obviously not. Leading doctors and lawyers called for Smethurst's release, or a new trial. A famous surgeon was commissioned to re-evaluate the case and concluded that the doctor was not guilty based on the evidence presented. The defendant was released, re-arrested for bigamy, and spent a year in jail. After leaving prison he disappeared from public life. Changes within continuity. The rituals of British justice hardly changed in the hundred years that separate the Palmer case from the Adams case. The pomp and ceremony remained the same, there is even more, the two trials began at the same time, ten in the morning. But within this continuity, notable changes can be seen, generally in favor of the accused. None of the doctors testified in their own defense, but Dr. Palmer had no choice, he was bound to remain silent. Only in 1898 was the accused allowed to testify under oath. Palmer's legal team, led by the distinguished Irish politician Sergeant Shi, had to endure a flagrant judicial bias that would have been intolerable a hundred years later. The public was angry against the defendant, the jockey club and the big insurance companies had also been aligned against him. All this determined the desire of the court to hang the defendant, and the magistrates made a public display of this state of mind. The medical evidence against Palmer was sunk, and the circumstantial evidence was contradictory. But the jury had been handpicked, and his verdict was in no doubt. One of the three magistrates openly mocked some of the arguments of the defense, and looked at the jury making gestures with his face so that his opinion was made very clear. Edwin James, one of the prosecution lawyers who helped hang Palmer, was expelled from the bar after five years. Cause, massive fraud. James was then a member of parliament, he managed to escape to the US leaving £100,000 worth of debts. In New York he resumed his legal career. And he even became an actor of some fame. Second part of the episode. The arrest, the secrets of the tombs. The exhumations of two Adams patients had led the Eastbourne police nowhere. If the doctor was hiding a secret, it would take more than a shovel to dig it up. Sheriff Hannum believed he had stumbled upon Adams' modus operandi, first he turned his victims into drug addicts, then he influenced them to change their wills in his favor, and finally, he nudged them out of the world of the living. It was as simple as difficult to prove. He and his men went through a myriad of material, but ended up picking a dozen cases and proceeding to break the nerve of the suspect by subjecting him to questioning. However, the approach to Adams had to be careful and subtle. The first meeting was organized as if it were casual. The detectives were walking just past the doctor's garage when the doctor was about to put his car away. Good afternoon, doctor. 
Did you have a good holiday in Scotland? And then the conversation went from his vacations to his Christian upbringing, and from there to the death of his mother, a sweet Christian soul, dash, so that it was the doctor himself who touched on the subject of all those rumors. Adams explained that they were due to people's envy. I think this is all God's doing, to teach me a new lesson. When Hannum referred to some of the bequests with concern, the doctor replied that they came from a very dear patient or a lifelong friend, adding that a good part of them came from him in lieu of his fee. The commissioner then mentioned the forged cremation certificates. And Adams exclaimed, oh, that wasn't done meanly. God knows not, we always want cremations to cause the least amount of grief to dear relatives. If he had told them that he was receiving money from the deceased by will, they might have been tempted to be suspicious. And I like burials and cremations to go smoothly. The doctor was faced with another eight weeks of whispers, leers and sensationalist speculation, which turned into outright accusations whenever British press law allowed. In France he could enjoy reading about the Bluebeard of Eastbourne. At 8.30 p.m. on a Saturday, Hannum and his men showed up at Adam's home with a search warrant issued under the Dangerous Drugs Act. The doctor was about to leave his home to head to a YMCA awards dinner celebration. The press found out in time and the suspect's house, in Kent Lodge, was virtually under siege by journalists. The sheriff ordered the blinds down, then asked Adams to let him inspect the log that all doctors are required to keep if they use drugs deemed dangerous. But this doctor was different from the others. I don't know what he means, she replied. I don't keep any records. And he added that he used only very occasionally that type of drug. Then Hannum showed him a formidable list of restricted-use drugs that he had prescribed to Mrs. Edith Morell, a wealthy Liverpool widow who bequeathed her first Rolls-Royce. Mrs. Morell had been dead for six years, but the sheriff had managed to compile the list from certain pharmacists' log books indicating that the patient had been administered massive doses of morphine and heroin. Who administered the drugs, the policeman asked. I did, almost all of them. Maybe the nurses gave him a dose, but most of it was administered by me, the suspect replied. Were there any drugs left after the patient died, asked the commissioner. Oh no, none. Everything was administered to the patient. Doctor. You ordered her to take 75 heroin pills the day before she died. Poor thing, she was in terrible agony. We used everything. I gave him the injections. Do you think it was too much, the doctor concluded. The doctor went to his office desk, dropped into the chair and began to cry with his head in his hands. Meanwhile, the infirmary was searched. Shortly after, one of the policemen surprised him trying to put something in his pocket. They turned out to be two vials of morphine solution. One of them, according to Adams, had been left over from the treatment of Mr. Sodden, who died at the Grand Hotel. And the other was for Mrs. Sharp, who died before she used it. On Monday morning Adams appeared before Eastbourne magistrates charged with 13 comparatively light charges. For distortions of the facts in relation to the Cremation Act, with the pretense of procuring the cremation of the remains of Mrs. Morell, of Mrs. Hullett and her husband Jack of a very wealthy retired bank manager named James Priestley Downs, and his sister-in-law, Amy Constance Ware. Jack Hullett died four months before his wife, shortly after the doctor injected him with morphine until he was left, a nurse said, not breathing. Downs was an 88-year-old widower who had broken his ankle when he first met Dr. Adams. He fell into a deep coma and died, leaving the doctor 1,000 pounds in inheritance. The doctor himself guided the old man's hand so that he could sign the legacy at the moment he fell into a coma. Downs's sister-in-law died aged 76, shortly after the doctor arranged for her to make a will leaving him 3,000 pounds. And where it was also said that the doctor should carefully examine the body of the deceased to ascertain her effective death before her cremation, a commission he faithfully fulfilled.
the doctor was paroled and set out to retrieve his passport. At the police station he commented that he was very worried about the expectation of new accusations. Hanum informed her that he was investigating other of his wealthy patients. Which ones? asked the doctor. Well, Mrs. Morell is certainly among them, replied the commissioner. The doctor's response would bring a lot of tail during the subsequent trial, easing the trance of a dying person is not such an evil thing, Adams protested. She wanted to die. That can't be murder. You can't accuse a doctor of that. Hannum and Hewitt were summoned to the office of the Attorney General, Sir Reginald Manningham Buller, in Parliament, when they already had sworn evidence of four deaths, both Hullett, Morell and Downs. The Attorney General's medical advisors filled him in on the case and briefly explained everything about heroin and its effects. Later, he himself had the doctor arrested for the murder of Edith Morell. Hannum and Hewitt took the 8.30 a.m. train to Eastbourne and met Inspector Pugh there. At 11.30 a.m., the doctor was returning from his morning visits accompanied by his chauffeur, who usually carried his briefcase, when a police car pulled up a few yards from Kent Lodge. Hannum got out of the vehicle dressed in a smart suit jacket and bowler hat, Hewitt and Pugh followed. At the gate he paused a moment to remove his yellow pigskin gloves. At the door they asked him to wait a moment, a patient came out and he entered. The guys from the press were on top of him, so on top of him, that Hannum had to throw a French reporter and his photographer out of the infirmary where the doctor was consulting. He immediately arrested Adams, who, showing signs of surprise, seemed to understand nothing, everything was inexplicable. The doctor looked from one policeman after another, and after a long, embarrassed silence, he said, murder? What murder? Can you prove it was murder? I don't think they can prove it. She was going to die anyway. Again there was a long silence. He then asked Hannum, will there be any more murder charges? The office receptionist helped him put on his trench coat. After her, visibly moved and with a few tears running down her cheeks, she took his hand tightly. He, resigned to her, replied, I'll see her in heaven. Once in the cell at the police station, the doctor was booked and frisked. He spent the night reading a Bible, concentrating, it seems, on passages from St. Matthew. The next day he held the preview in the tiny city hall court. He was packed to the brim with people. The detainee was informed that the accusation to which he would have to answer in court would be murder and not professional negligence for not keeping an adequate medical record. After this brief appearance the doctor was taken back to his cell. The windows of Kent Lodge were covered by heavy curtains. The only indication that the house was inhabited was a dim glow of light filtering through the glass of the front door. However, the owner, the well-known Dr. Bodkin Adams, of Eastbourne, was now staying at Bixton Prison. He found some comfort in the Christmas cards and thought how lucky he was to have had time to send his own before the police arrested him. Fatal Doses The doses that Mrs. Morell was prescribed in the final stages of her illness were six times what a healthy person could tolerate. Ultimately, the amounts of it would have killed her, but were possibly designed to spare her suffering. November 9th. Heroin, 25 tablets, 6 granules and a quarter. Morphine, 25 tablets, 12 and a half granules. November 10th. Heroin, 25 tablets, 6 granules and a quarter. November 11th. Hyperduric morphine, 6 granules. Morphine, 25 tablets, 12 and a half granules. Heroin, 25 tablets, 6 granules and a quarter. 12th of November. Peraldehyde, 4 ounces. Heroin, 75 tablets, 12 and a half granules. 1 pellet equals 65 milligrams. Point of Mira, a refuge on the coast. In the 1950s Eastbourne was, as it is today, a haven for the elderly. 
The idea of multiple murders seemed, therefore, doubly shocking. In 1956 Eastbourne was a true Victorian stronghold, a retreat for those who had reached the age where life becomes memories. So that the unusual interest was aroused by this doctor that Adams, apart from frightening, also stoked a certain emotion. Journalists were everywhere, taking photos of the venerable old ladies and accosting those who, accommodated in their wheelchairs, enjoyed the sounds of the string quartet in the luxurious hall of the Grand Hotel. But the main center of press interest was Adams's home, Kent Logdy. A dull gray chalet in Trinity Trees, just behind the Grand Parade. Both Brown's Drugstore, where the doctor used to buy his medicine, and Marsh's Candy Store, where he drank his favorite chocolate, had gained a certain reputation. They were both related to the doctor, and both very close to his house. But no one made it easy for the Scotland Yard detectives. Residents, and especially the doctor's patients, kept tight-lipped during all police interviews. A member of the investigative team described it this way years later, remember the place and the time. Post-war Eastbourne was a rich, closed and snobbish place, where everyone was a goof. We were like rotten fish that suddenly falls among the canapes at a fancy party and nobody likes the smell. Preview, Face to Face In January 1957 the police and representatives of the Crown believed they had enough evidence to prosecute Adams. A formidable legal team was assembled to bring him to justice. The trial as such was preceded by a complex, dress rehearsal, in the form of proceedings relating to the release of the defendant. These hearings went on for nine days and generated another bumper crop of sensational headlines. On a freezing January morning in 1957, Dr. Adams was brought before the Eastbourne magistrates, all of them old friends of the doctor, who now looked at him with stony faces as they dealt a death blow to his cause. Crown Counsel Melford Stevenson was allowed to link Mrs. Morell's death in 1950 to the death of the Hullets in 1956. In this way he established a criminal pattern that made Adams a multiple murderer. In the Hullet case, a nurse recounted how she had spied on the doctor preparing an injection with an inevitably fatal dose of concentrated morphine solution. I don't think it was a normal death, the nurse declared before the investigating magistrates. She also maintained that the doctor ruled the cause of death, cerebral hemorrhage, without even looking at the body. It emerged from the pharmacist's log book that Adams had ordered five morphine pellets on Mrs. Hullett's behalf the day after her death, it was said, to replenish stocks. Immediately afterwards, an expert declared that an injection containing more than a quarter of a dissolved granule would have been dangerous for the patient. It was Mrs. Hullett's death that aroused the most angry protests and anger. The forensic examination revealed the existence of the equivalent of 115 barbiturate granules in her body, hence the first verdict was suicide. A long statement from the doctor was read. In it he described himself as the person who had reunited that couple. According to the defendant, Mrs. Hullett had lost the will to live after losing such a rich and lovable husband. But she was not able to convincingly explain why she had expedited payment on her £1,000 check just before she died, nor why she kept secret that she was taking barbiturates. The Crown did have an explanation, the same pattern is repeated, Stevenson argued. A wealthy patient, drugged in large quantities over a long period of time, and in the end, a fatal dose. A patient who was obviously under the influence of his doctor. The way to act, the patient's will, which provided benefits to the doctor. The impatience, that of obtaining that money. Adams returned to Brixton Prison where he would still wait another three months before the start of the actual trial, in which he was accused of murdering Edith Alice Morell. Who had died years before. The Hullet case would be the subject of a separate indictment, the Attorney General decided, whose tactic was to keep it in reserve for a hypothetical second trial. The actors in the plot in courtroom one of the Old Bailey were the same, except for the Attorney General, Sir Reginald Manningham Buller, who now personally led the prosecution, and the judge, Patrick Devlin. 
He would preside over the trial of that plump man who sat in the dock and would do so dressed in the requisite red toga, large wig, and black cloak that signaled the possibility of a death sentence. Despite the fact that the spectacular accusations against Adams had electrified the atmosphere in the courtroom, the doctor firmly and with some dignity pleaded, not guilty. The attorney general was brimming with optimism, he addressed the jury to tell them that they should erase from their minds everything they had heard about the defendant. The only thing they should care about was the fate of Mrs. Morell, afterwards the prosecutor described the fate of the victim at length. The key to the prosecution's argument was the following, Mrs. Morell was an unpleasant little old woman, condemned to prostration and half paralyzed by illness, attended by four nurses day and night without rest and the doctor who had to be permanently at her disposal. He began injecting her with doses of morphine and heroin, and after a while he called her lawyer to write a new will in which she left him a chest of silver. A few months later, Adams contacted Mrs. Morell's lawyer again to tell him that the elderly woman wanted to leave her Rolls Royce and her jewelry to him. But the patient began to complain more seriously and the doctor decided to spend a vacation in Scotland, then the aforementioned became picky and spiteful, so much so that the doctor began to fear that he would be left with nothing. So he started dousing her on drugs until she died. He obtained the rolls and the silver, not to mention a fee of over £1,700, which was borne by her deceased's real estate. It's one thing to prescribe a little old lady something to put her to sleep, and quite another to prescribe huge amounts of morphine and heroin, Sir Reginald explained. His true purpose was to create an addiction in the patient, an uncontrolled desire, dependency. He remained to expose what the press called, the fatal fortnight. The prosecutor then went on to interpret the facts, see how the amounts prescribed are increased. In the last 13 days of Mrs. Morell's life, the doses of morphine increased three times, and those of heroin, seven and a half times, compared to the preceding months. And because? Why did the doctor order these tremendous amounts, these fatal amounts, if there was no plausible medical justification? A silent pause. He did it because she decided it was time for her to die. The prosecution reached the final hours of Mrs. Morell's life. She was very weak, except for occasional spasms, she was in a coma. And with a dramatic and theatrical gesture, a large syringe suddenly appeared in her hand. Sir Reginald held it over her head. The doctor gave this syringe to the night shift nurse, and told her to inject it into the unconscious patient. She did so, so he took the empty syringe and refilled it with the same amount, both abnormally large amounts, and told the nurse to give him a second injection if the patient didn't calm down. The nurse did not give that second injection, but late at night she called the doctor at her house to consult him. And she received the precise order from him. Her obligation was to obey her and she gave him the second injection. Mrs. Morell calmed down and at two in the morning she died herself. The prosecution had expert witnesses who declared that the appropriate dose of heroin in these cases, the maximum advisable dose, was a quarter of a granule. And in the case of morphine, half a granule. The pharmacist's books proved the purchase of 38 pellets of heroin and 40 of morphine, which were administered between November 8 and 12. And to more abundance were the doctor's own words saying that everything was administered to the patient. The doctor sat between two guards with tight lips. Every so often he would shake his head from side to side, as he would for the rest of the trial. Fighting Lawyer Sir Reginald Manningham Bowler was a rough-and-tumble lawyer, an Eton student, and nicknamed Sir Nosy by the press. He disagreeable even to members of his own party, the Tory. He wanted to become Minister of Justice and had the necessary political support that would enthrone him if he achieved a resounding victory in any trial. The Bodkin Adams case was just what he was looking for, sensation and fame in just the right measure. Sir Reginald hoped he could meet the defendant in the dock, and wring a guilty plea out of him. Adding to the excitement of the whole situation, 
it turned out that the judge in the case, Sir Patrick Devlin, was considered a direct rival to Manning and Buller for the coveted post. They were both 50 years old, but apart from that everything set them apart. Sir Patrick had a sharp, cutting sense of legality and a biting wit, and he secretly despised the man he publicly called Reggie. The ambition of his rival seemed laughable to him. First Steps, Mama's Boy The world of men was not made for Adams. His upbringing had sweetened him, giving him that charm that would later endear him to his wealthy female patients. John Bodkin Adams was born in rural Uster, surrounded by a deeply pious atmosphere. His earliest memories of him were of his mother, kneeling and praying with him at his side. They both listened as his father, Samuel, intoned the words of the Lord. Samuel Adams was a watchmaker and lay preacher in the small town of Randallstown, in County Antrim. His wife, Ellen, was a bodkin, a family known for its religious fervor and good hand in business. John was his first child and came into the world, in the room above the watch shop, on January 21, 1899. The family prospered until they were able to buy a house overlooking Loch Nee, where little John grew up. He went to the Methodist school on a nearby hillside, and he would accompany his father miles and miles to the meeting place of the Plymouth Brethren, where he preached. Samuel Adams, a stern but fair man, was in very poor health and the boy later clung to his mother. A quiet little boy who almost always prefers to be alone. This is how she described him at the time. He later also became a fat little boy who adored cream and chocolate cakes. When he was 12 years old, his family moved to Coleraine, where his father died and soon after they took in an orphan cousin. Florence, who became a part of the family as if she had been born into him. His mother bought John a motorcycle and his cousin gave him a nickname, Buzz, that would stick with him for the rest of his life. Both family branches had doctors, and there was even a Bodkin hospital in China, which demonstrated the efforts made by the family in the missionary facet. So that plump young man began to study medicine at Queen's University in Belfast. His mother and Florence moved close to him and settled in a house in one of the better parts of the city. The medical career was not an easy thing, the young man had a nervous breakdown and had to be restored by his devoted family nurses. He made a full recovery and finished his studies with good grades. Anatomy professor Richard Hunter remembered the student Bodkin well, when we dissected a body, I would assign three students to one arm, another three to the other, and so on. Normally those three students worked together until the end of the course. But Adams, no. He first worked with one group and then with another. With any group in which he had a place to fit him. He's just how he was, a lone wolf. He followed a year's internship at a Bristol hospital. Then he answered an ad in an evangelical magazine for a young Christian assistant doctor to help with an important practice on the South Coast. The practice was in Eastbourne and as Adams later explained, what caught his attention and encouraged him to answer was the adjective, Christian. His mother and Florence, of course, also went to Eastbourne. The days began with the 6.30 a.m. prayers, and ended with the Bible study classes that Adams taught in the basement of the house at night. Above the doctor's bed hung a quote from the Bible, Rest in the Lord. Bodkin Adams began by making his visits on a motorcycle, his briefcase strapped to the back. But he soon acquired a car, and it wasn't long before the car was chauffeur-driven. The rapid progress was due to his willingness to see patients at any hour of the day or night and the patronage he enjoyed from the Mahouds, aluminum manufacturers who owned lands vast enough to employ a game warden. And organize pheasant hunts. Dr. Adams was still riding his motorbike when one night he was called to attend to Mrs. Mahoud, who had broken her leg. She liked her youthful honesty and her willingness to attend to a sick person so late at night. Adams soon became a regular visitor to the mansion and was welcomed into the wealthy and influential circle of friends of the couple. 
Mahud themselves advanced him £3,000 to buy a house to match his new social status. That house was called Kent Lodge, a stern and quiet Victorian chalet in the highly respectable Trinity Trees area. Within ten years Dr. Adams had made a name for himself in Eastbourne, catering to the region's rural well-to-do class and the wealthy elderly who flocked to that privileged corner of Sussex. The doctor assistant became the owner of the practice until he needed the help of three other doctors to take care of the numerous patients. Despite remaining a very pious man, he took a liking to the good life and became a good shot who bought shotguns at Putty and Son of St. James, the most expensive and exclusive establishment among those with a royal license. He helped found shooting clubs for the social elite and became a member of a gourmet club. His waist swelled elegantly clad in exclusive Seville row suits, and he bought himself more cars, as befitted a man of his position. He was briefly engaged to the daughter of a wealthy butcher, but her mother did not like the bride-to-be, and she exerted such influence that she managed to break off the engagement. Adams would no longer toy with the idea of marriage. Rich little old ladies became his specialty, as they were often alone. Such was the case with Matilda Whitten, the 75-year-old widow of a Northampton shoe manufacturer. Adams rented her car and her driver, and occasionally accompanied her on excursions to Beachy Head. Overnight she became the executor of her will and when she died she got a juicy £3,000, not a small amount in 1935. The family of the deceased declared their dissatisfaction with the will and, pushed by his mother, the doctor defended his right before the Supreme Court and won. Around this time an anonymous note arrived in the mail, on it someone had written a notice, keep your fingers crossed and don't dump any more rich widows. Desire for Power John Bodkin Adams was the victim of a domineering mother, ruled by an insane fanaticism. As a Dutch psychotherapist put it, until the day of her death in 1943, her mother ruled her whole life and the true way of thinking of her. Her burning desire to please her mother overrode the development of his own personality. The pressure was there, a subconscious libido, a self that was trying to escape. How was it possible to contain those tensions? First, thanks to speed, motorcycles, and then cars. For the first time he was in control of himself. And later his passion for shooting. Here was power that he had never possessed. A shotgun, the power that separates life from death. In his job he also had that power to give life, or death. The trial, a magnificent defense. At the old bailey the die seemed to be cast for Adams. But his lawyer made a brilliant defense, exposing the lack of concrete evidence of the prosecutor's arguments. The second day of the trial was dramatic from the very beginning. There was a bomb threat and the courtroom was thoroughly searched before the hearing began, but no trace of it was found. However, the events that would take place in the room were going to be explosive enough. The prosecutor began by calling his key witnesses, the nurses who witnessed the death of Edith Morell. He first took the turn of Helen Rose Stronach, a strong, heavy-set woman with a thin mouth and prominent jaw. He described the patient as a lost-minded and semi-conscious woman. He also stated that neither she nor the other nurses were allowed to remain in the room while the doctor was with the patient. And that he never knew what was the content of the injections that he gave her during that period. The defense attorney, Jeffrey Lawrence, rose to question the witness himself, with a deceptively languid air. He seemed to be expressing genuine sympathy for the nurse for forcing her to remember things that had happened so long ago. And he was interested in whether he made some kind of report during his work. The nurse Stronach thus attested, everything was written down in a book and then signed it. And everything that you wrote in that notebook, would it be accurate information for having taken it at that very moment? That's how it is. So, different from your memories, those notes would, of course, be absolutely accurate. A certain nervousness seized the representatives of the prosecution. Lawrence seemed to sigh. 
So if we had those reports, now we could know exactly what happened then, day after day, and night after night. Yeah. But you have our word instead of the pad, the nurse replied to reassure the lawyer. The trap had worked. I want you to take a look at this notebook, please. What fell into the hands of the witness was a notebook with the notes that she herself made during Mrs. Morell's illness. The Attorney General sat up in her chair, wide-eyed, and sank back into her without saying a word. Lawrence dragged out the agony. The nurse recognized yet another notebook, and then a third. All three were authentic. The defense then informed the court that he had in his possession all the notes made by the nurses, from June 1949 until the time of her death, eight notebooks in all. These reports are usually made when there is a risk of patient death. Hannam's men had unforgivably overlooked them. The defense attorney, however, found them in a package behind a desk at Kent Lodge. Lawrence set about ruthlessly discrediting Helen Rose Stronach. He had an impact on each and every one of the points where the nurse's statements had deviated from what was stated in the reports. The climax of his intervention occurred with the examination one day in November in which, according to the nurse, the patient was in a semi-conscious state. The note said that that day the patient ate partridge with celery, and a pudding for dessert. All this accompanied by a good cognac and soda. The nurses were now more than a little intimidated. Helen Mason Ellis, the next witness, declined to give her opinion of Mrs. Morell's condition, and did so in an almost imperceptible small voice. So long ago, she murmured to herself over and over again. But Lawrence wasn't done yet. During her interrogation, he literally tormented the thin and pale nurse Mason Ellis until she confessed that what Nurse Stronick had declared was a lie, the patient's drugs were not kept in a locked cabinet. Actually, they had always been in an unlocked drawer. A defense spy overheard it that same morning during a conversation the two nurses had on the train from Eastbourne, violating their obligation not to discuss any aspect of the case with each other. The prosecution's basic witness was Nurse Randall, a stout woman in the Stronic style, who was with the patient last night. It was supposed that it was she who gave the coup de grace to the patient with the large syringe that she showed in court. She was now faced with the notes she made that night, and nothing as melodramatic as described by the Attorney General emerged from them. The doctor was said to have injected himself with peraldehyde, a comparatively harmless sleep aid, before leaving the house that night. The notes continued to describe the evolution of the patient in the last hours before her death. 11.30 p.m., very restless. He doesn't sleep. 12.30 a.m., restless and talkative, and very shaky, very shaky, underlined twice. 12.45 a.m., it seems a little calmer. Apparently asleep. Respiration at 5.02 a.m. She passed on to a better life without incident. Lawrence suppressed a smirk. It doesn't seem like his memory is very reliable, he suggested. The nurse replied that Mrs. Morell's shakes were the worst she had witnessed in all her long practice of the profession she practically threw her out of bed. She would never want to see something like that again and she insisted that she administered the last injection with the large syringe that the doctor left ready for her. She for some reason had omitted to write it down, probably because the patient's death made it go away. However, the damage had already been done, it was the word of a nurse that contradicted her own written notes. The notebooks revealed the pathetic details of a difficult and demanding woman's struggle against death, who occasionally became hysterical, and was always hurling insults around her. They contained data on a large number of drugs administered to sedate her, and an acute tendency towards insomnia, and in later stages of the disease, the violent spasmodic jerks produced by opiate poisoning. The drugs listed were few fewer than she was said to have been administered, but the prosecution argued that she was still dealing with lethal doses nonetheless. The prosecution now focused on the statement of her most important medical witness, Dr. Arthur Henry Douthwaite. 
This was a tall, well-built man, and he was considered an eminence in all things opiate-related. He stated that he was horrified by Bodkin Adams's methods, as he considered them deadly, and strongly believed in his guilt. His voice sounded very convincing as he explained that the defendant turned Mrs. Morell into a drug addict, and that, in the final phase, her intention was to finish her off. Dr. Douthwaite found a sinister motive for whatever his colleague had done. The switch to peraldehyde was to increase the deadly effect of heroin by causing a state of unconsciousness. But Lawrence once again had an ace up his sleeve. He produced medical reports from Cheshire showing that Dr. Adams was not the first to administer morphine to the patient, another doctor had already done so after she suffered a stroke in 1948. Dr. Douthwaite did not relent an inch, condemning Cheshire's prescription as equally deadly to the patient. The trial turned into a fight between different specialists, who differed over the nurse's notes and over an 81-year-old woman's tolerance for heroin. To counter the prosecution's experts, Lawrence had another illustrious Harley Street doctor testify that he was as confident as Adams in the use of opiates. The lawyer began his defense on the 13th day of the trial, requesting the dismissal of the accusations and the acquittal of the accused. But the judge did not accept his request and this seemed to discourage the lawyer. Then he dropped the bombshell, he would not call the defendant to testify. The reason he gave for preventing Adams from testifying was compassion, do you begin to understand the strain this man has had to live under all these years? He urged the jury to consider only the nurse's notebooks, the only witnesses who are eloquent and at the same time indisputable. The judge facilitated the work of the jury by summarizing the case. It's not a pretty story, he admitted, but not all rogues are murderers. He then repeated the doctor's words, murder. Can you prove it? The jury took 44 minutes to deliver their verdict. It was three minutes past 12 on the 17th day of the longest trial in British criminal history up to that time. The doctor got up, his blue suit was this time a little more wrinkled than usual. When the word innocent was uttered, the entire room heaved a sigh. Ah. The doctor's face flushed, he took a deep breath, bowed stiffly to the judge, and said, thank you. It was the first word he had uttered since he pleaded not guilty. The attorney general let it be known that he would not pursue the second prosecution, the Hullet case, and Dr. Adams, admittedly triumphant, was acquitted. The Savior. The trial made a celebrity out of Jeffrey Lawrence, an unknown lawyer who was surprisingly entrusted with defending Adams. Lawrence was a small, quiet, and wise man of 55, master of the art of throwing poison darts very politely. This was his first major criminal trial, but his tenacity and meticulous preparation were well known from the other cases he had handled, celebrity divorces and torturous disputes in local governments. That's where his reputation came from. With this case he demonstrated that he too was a master in the field of sharp and bold interrogation. Commentators compared him to a magician or a bullfighter. Manningham Buller was the beast to beat. Every time the Attorney General presented a new witness or a new argument, Lawrence had ready a document or a statement of facts that disproved the contrary thesis. Shortly after the Adams case he was granted a knighthood. In his private life, Jeffrey Lawrence was a skilled violinist and dairy cow farmer. His farm won the best kept farm in all of Sussex. Lady Loyal Lady Prendergast, the 70-year-old widow of Admiral Sir Robert Prendergast, kept Dr. Adams supplied with fruit and chocolate. Other faithful patients also gave him gifts. The doctor continued to benefit from certain bequests while he was incarcerated at Brixton Prison. The Brixton authorities counted more than 150 letters from former patients, all expressing their support for him. The doctor would reply with his writing, wire-legged, assuring everyone that he was not losing sleep over the situation. Don't be worried or discouraged, he said in a prototypical letter. Everything will end well. 
British justice and the strength of my prayers will prove that I am free from sin when the Lord's hour comes. Open debate, analgesics and sedatives. Euthanasia poses the key dilemma about the value of life. The medical establishment had gone up in arms over the Adams case, and did everything they could to get the doctor acquitted. There were many good reasons for this. The idea that Britain harbored the greatest bluebeard in history was already terrible, a man who for 30 years would have been killing his most loyal patients for the money they might have left him. Public trust in doctors was at stake. To what extent was it safe to be admitted to a hospital? Having a doctor accused of murder was disaster enough, but seeing his own nurses testify against him had even more disturbing implications. It was also feared that the case would set a precedent and, immediately afterwards, would be limited to the possibility of prescribing certain drugs for the terminally ill, putting the doctor to fail in his attempt to prolong the life of his patient in the face of permanent danger of a judicial process. The medical press collected all these arguments in a long and hated article, this is the first time, to our knowledge, that a doctor has been accused of murder for prolonging treatment beyond all reasonable limits. Indeed, this trial is without precedent in England, and not only in our country, but in the entire Western world. One of the consequences for our patients will be that in the future they will suffer considerably more than they have hitherto. Every doctor with normal humanitarian feelings has always felt the impulse to reduce the suffering of his patients to a minimum and, in desperate cases, has seldom stopped to evaluate the cost of treatment by the measure of life that remained to the patient. Countless patients have been put into a dream state to ease their agony. That will no longer be the case from now on, as we assume all of us will be looking suspiciously out of the corner of our eyes to see if we spot that smiling sadist with a scalpel, someone who takes notes on our pains to use against us later. The doctors commissioned the Medical Defense Union, the defense of Dr. Adams. It was Hem Sons, its director, who selected Jeffrey Lawrence to head the defense legal team. He was also the one who provided most of her legal and medical ammunition, such as Mrs. Morell's medical records before she was treated by Dr. Adams. Hem Sons also retained Dr. Simpson, who was for many years a home office pathologist and a colleague and student of Dr. Douthwaite, the prosecution witness. Simpson's job was to find out anything that would undermine the arguments put forward by the prosecution, stopping at nothing. Simpson combed through the prescription record books of a clinic that had been used by Dr. Douthwaite, and was able to prove that the prosecution witness himself prescribed large doses of morphine and heroin, for which he convicted Dr. Adams before the jury. Charts were made to be presented as evidence in court, but it was not necessary, the relentless questioning to which Dr. Douthwaite was subjected was considered sufficient to discredit his thesis. Although Dr. Douthwaite was not left out in public as a hypocrite, he would soon pay a heavy price for his stubbornness. The presidency of the Royal College of Physicians, which was to be his the following year, was forever denied him. The acquittal of Bodkin Adams heralded an ugly future for the euthanasia discussion, mercy killing. The doctor himself had spoken of Mrs. Morell's easing the passage towards death. His expressions were left unanalyzed. The specter of euthanasia arose fatally tinged by the benefit implied by the subsequent and hypothetical legacy. In 1957 English law considered euthanasia as murder. A survey carried out among British doctors in 1987 indicated that 35 per 100 were willing to practice euthanasia at the patient's request whenever it was decided to legalize it. The Fallacy of Sweet Death In October 1971 a Dutch doctor, Gertrude Postma, injected a deadly dose of morphine into her elderly mother, a victim of a brain hemorrhage, partially paralyzed, deaf and mute. Dr. Postma was accused of practicing euthanasia, which at the time was punishable by a maximum sentence of 12 years in prison. At her trial she was asked if she felt any remorse and she replied, on the contrary, I should have done it much sooner. She was not sentenced to prison, but instead got a suspended sentence and a year of probation. This case marked a turning point in the Netherlands, 
it became the first country to accept euthanasia. By 1981, euthanasia had become so commonplace that the Rotterdam Assize Court issued guidelines for behavior that, if strictly followed, virtually exempted the doctor from criminal prosecution. Another doctor then went a step further by writing on a death certificate, unnatural death, as the cause of death. She was a 94-year-old woman, with her vital faculties tremendously weakened, who had asked the doctor to put an end to her life. She so she did it by injections of barbiturates and curare. The doctor was tried and found innocent. Later, the Court of Appeal reviewed the sentence and revoked it. The case went all the way to the Dutch Supreme Court, which ruled that the doctor's actions were justified. The rest of a life, the long goodbye. Adams walked out of the trial a free man and legally innocent. By then he could not suspect that rumors and suspicions would continue to haunt him until the end of his days. Dr. Bodkin Adams received his salvation from the scaffold with measured calm. At all times I knew what was going to happen, he declared. God has a clear design in putting me through this. I have never taken it as a hard test. He was kidnapped by the Daily Express after leaving the trial. It was the newspaper that had helped him throughout, championed his cause, and now, because of his investment of £10,000, he considered the doctor his property. While the Real Adams was transferred to Fleet Street, another doctor was in charge of distracting the press. A party had been arranged in Fleet Street to celebrate the success, but the doctor declined the glass of champagne he was offered. At midnight they put him in a newspaper delivery van and took him to a shelter on the coast. There a team of journalists was commissioned to get the entire story of him. Every April, the month of the acquittal, the doctor called journalist Percy Hoskins, a specialist in the crime section of the Express, and always gave him the same message, thank you for giving me another year of life. Others had less reason to party. The trial, and above all the surprising performance of the defense, were studied and established as a classic case that exemplified the action of British justice. However, someone had to take responsibility for the prosecution's blunders. In less than a week, interpolations were presented in Parliament. A member of the Labour opposition demanded an independent inquiry into the preparation, organization and conduct of the case by representatives of the Crown. The Attorney General rejected this proposal out of hand, but criticism intensified and he never got the post of Minister of Justice that he had so desired. Scotland Yard conducted an internal inquiry into how to proceed during the police investigation. Relations between Commissioner Hannam and the press were studied in depth. The results were never made public, but within a year his career in the police came to an end, after which he took a job in a private security agency. The doctor pleaded guilty to 14 counts of professional negligence before Lewis magistrates, all wrongdoing that came to light during the police investigation, and was fined £2,400. Five months into the trial his right to prescribe or possess dangerous drugs was revoked by the Home Secretary. In November he had to appear before the Medical Disciplinary Council and his name disappeared from the official medical record. One Christmas Eastbourne students put on an infamous parody of the Christmas Carol, The Twelve Days of Christmas, with a chorus going. Eleven exhumations, ten women cremated, nine hypodermics, eight fake prescriptions, seven Rolls Royces, six mad spinsters. Until arriving at a Bodkin Adams of Trinity Trees. However, the doctor was not publicly humiliated or expelled from Ken Logdi. Despite having withdrawn his professional titles, he continued to treat patients who were faithful to him, and continued to receive his legacies. At Marsha's candy store, where he continued to buy his handmade Swiss chocolate, there was never a word against Adams. Little by little he returned to make society life, to the point that the Queen of the Eastbourne Carnivals made the trip in her Rolls Royce, Hullet's ex Rolls Royce, without raising too many encouraging comments. In 1961, after several unsuccessful attempts, he was included again in the official medical register. 
And in that moment he felt strong enough to lash out at the accusers of old. He brought a libel suit against 13 newspapers that had once insulted him, agreeing to pay him a hefty sum for his excessive zeal in his investigations and pre-trial publications. The doctor kept a watchful eye for the future and in 1969 still won 500 pounds in compensation from a weekly, along with an abject apology for invoking the shadow of Dr. Bodkin Adams by commenting on the failure of cash injections to revive the disease. Pound Sterling He devoted more and more time to shooting, becoming the president of the Clay Pigeon Shooting Association and also his honorary medical officer. The last cup was won at 80 years of age. A few months later, while on a shooting excursion in Sussex, he broke his leg. The tear was complicated, and three days later he had died. Dr. Bodkin Adams outlived many of his accusers and defenders, but those who survived him returned to the matter with the same fervor as before. Did this man escape punishment for murder? The Mail on Sunday asked, devoting several pages to the truth that can now be told. The Daily Express reaffirmed its conviction that Adams was innocent. The Times called it the classic conundrum in the annals of mass murder. The Attorney General was dead, but Melford Stevenson, who had meanwhile been knighted, kept his convictions intact. He told journalist Rodney Hallworth, We had so much material that was incredible. As I remember it, there was clear evidence in six murder cases, and enough material to charge him with murder in half a dozen others. He was so incredibly lucky to get off the gallows. Inspector Hannum was dead, but retired Chief Superintendent Hewitt, the sergeant on that case, was as convinced as ever of the doctor's guilt. The mistakes that were made were tremendous, that was the luck of the doctor. In fact, I have always believed that this case should be used in police manuals for the instruction of new cadets. I have since seen the same mistakes made in the Adams case in other cases. The lessons we learned so hard could have greatly benefited other research. Bodkin Adams' funeral was an event attended by 150 friends and patients, and millions of television viewers. A former mayor of the city of Eastbourne praised Adams, the victim of a malicious rumor campaign carried out by those who have never known the slightest thing about this real man and his ways of practicing medicine. Then his will was read. The great legacy hunter left a net £402,907 to be divided into 47 parts, with none of the heirs receiving more than £5,000 in all. These beneficiaries included the one who was the doctor's girlfriend. Nora O'Hara, 19 other friends who were by her side in the days of suffering, the housekeeper, the chauffeur, the shopkeeper, even the one in charge of winding the doctor's collection of watches weekly. No one was forgotten and, faithful to his convictions until the last moment, Dr. Bodkin Adams also left a legacy to his own doctor. One less witness. Retired Chief Constable Hewitt believes a witness who died in the middle of the criminal investigation may have been the subject of foul tricks. This has been by far the most important accusation that has been made since the death of Dr. Adams. Hewitt said the victim was a Mrs. Sharp, manager of the nursing home where the Neil Miller sisters and other Bodkin Adams patients stayed. Hewitt and Hannum visited her on two occasions. Mrs. Sharp was the key to the whole case. She knew where the bodies were buried and she was willing to talk, even though she was scared, afraid. She at any moment she would collapse. One more visit from her was enough for us, but it was never possible to meet with her again. She died while we were away. It is true that she was not in good health, but it is so curious that she died just as she did and that she was cremated so quickly. I always had the feeling, and it was never more than that, a suspicion, that the doctor hastened the moment of death a little. And as on so many other occasions, he left us without a corpse. A subsequent investigation established that the nursing home manager named Annie Sharp died of cancer on November 13, 1956, at the age of 76. Did the doctor get away with murdering the old woman again, or was he innocent? 
right to remain silent. Bodkin Adams surprised the prosecution, throughout the trial he sat upright, not saying a word. Under English law, he was entitled to it. But with this attitude he raised the question of whether it would not be more convenient to authorize the prosecution to interrogate the defendant under oath. Sir Melford Stevenson, a member of the prosecution, was still fuming many years later, we had a real mountain of material to cross-examine Adams, he complained. I firmly believe that the current law does not serve the purposes of justice. The judge held, however, a completely different opinion. He told the jury, the terror we feel at the idea that a man might be questioned, forced to speak, and perhaps convicted in his own words is so great, that we concede to any suspect in a crime, in any case, and to the end, the right to say, don't ask me any questions. I will not answer any. Prove your theses. Conclusions. In 1967, and as a direct consequence of the Adams case, the law was modified to leave to the defense the decision of whether the press should have access to the room of the investigation processes. The case inspired a number of authors. Sybil Bedford wrote a classic description of the trial, reflecting the atmosphere during the trial. She concluded by saying that the doctor was innocent, but also that he had been extremely lucky to have a brilliant team to defend him, and an unusual intelligence judge. Other journalists also wrote accounts of the trial. Some spoke in favor of the doctor, others, just as emphatically, against him. In 1985 the trial judge ruled on it. The now Lord Devlin thus became the first judge to write a book about a trial that he had to preside over. With devastating wit, Devlin scoffed at the Attorney General's arguments. He then went on to state his own conclusions. He suggested that Dr. Adams may have been operating in that gray area between legal and illegal, that he might be a euthanasia mercenary, a compassionate yet greedy man, willing to sell death. And that, if that was the case, he was disgracing a great profession. Lord Devlin would then become a detective, scrutinizing Mrs. Morell's last hours, re-examining the aborted evidence. He was analyzing the matter of the large syringe which, according to the nurse's testimony, was filled with harmless peraldehyde. The judge stressed that the peraldehyde had an unpleasant, intense, and very characteristic odor, which would have invaded the patient's room. However, Nurse Randall didn't seem to have smelled anything. She was also referencing a comment that was not accepted as evidence. The nurse stated that the patient told her that the doctor had promised that she would not allow her to suffer in the end. Then Devlin dealt with the three bottles of heroin, 75 tablets making 12 and a half pellets, purchased from Brown's Pharmacy on the eve of Mrs. Morell's death. Did peraldehyde exist? Devlin wondered. The only proof was provided by the doctor himself. No one ever found out about the three bottles of heroin. The judge reviewed various explanations for what happened, stating that he suspected that the doctor had left the injection loaded with a lethal dose of heroin before leaving the nurse in charge of the patient's care. Quoting the doctor's own comments to the police about facilitating traffic, Lord Devlin deduced, he did not believe himself to be a murderer, but a dispenser of death. As far as he understood it, he had done nothing wrong. There was nothing wrong with a doctor who received a legacy, nor with what he gave in return, would he think it was, in return, a pleasant death like the one that heroin provided. The attorney general must have had his suspicions about peraldehyde too. But why didn't he expose them? Again, Lord Devlin offered a possible explanation, it was not the solution the prosecution wanted. Taking the life of a weakened woman on her deathbed would have been a poor end to the story of the Eastbourne Massacre. And so concludes our journey through the intriguing and complex story of John Bodkin Adams, a man whose life and actions continue to spark debate and scrutiny. His case raises profound questions about ethics, trust, and the fine line between life and death in medical practice. If you find value in this work and would like to support the Crime Library, 
please consider making a small monthly contribution. Your support helps us continue to explore these exciting topics. I want to thank everyone for joining me on this episode. Don't forget to subscribe for not to miss future explorations in the dark and fascinating world of criminology. Until next time in La Criminotica. Goodbye.